Well, hi, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. This is going to be a little bit different uh, in, in this program, because we're making a transition. I think I had mentioned that in the last couple of programs. And that, that difference is, to go this way, for, we started this program to do a search for Christianity. And that's based on the fact that I've had the opportunity, Alice and I, and even Mark, we, we have who are both here, by the way, just off screen today, and had the opportunity to travel to many different countries and on different continents and spend time with churches, people in churches. And I, I found such variance in the way Christianity is practiced and very rarely found it to be what I think it ought to be. And I, I pray, as I said before, I'm not saying that to be judgmental, but I believe that God, this is a time, and it won't be only me here, but I believe God is going to lift up and raise up a lot of voices to call people back, not to a revival that a lot of people are looking for, but to a reformation, to reform, to bring us back to that place where we need to be in our relationship with the Lord. And I was thinking, you know, we're, I, I said we're in search of Christianity. And that's, I am being somewhat loose in my use of the term there. Certainly Jesus, when he returns, is not going to be searching for Christianity. He's not going to be searching for church buildings. He's not going to be going from denomination to denomination. What Jesus said was, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? And I asked this before, how do you see faith? You know, James says you can't see faith. You can only see the actions of faith. The Word of God says that the righteous shall walk by faith. Our lives are supposed to be that way. But it's about righteousness. Righteousness is what should be visible. And what Jesus will search for then is the fruit of faith, righteousness. And that's what I want to talk about as we go into this new part of the program. So, Father, I just ask your blessing upon this time. I ask, Lord God, that you would put a guard over my mouth. Lord, that you would, that you would lead me to be a blessing to people listening, to encourage them to seek you in their relationship with you. That we all, in these perilous last days, might draw closer and closer to you with a desire for holiness in our lives, Lord God. So I praise you and thank you that you can use this time, that you can use this ministry, that you can use me, Lord God, because you use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise, and you use the weak to shame the strong. So, Lord, I pray your blessing upon this in Jesus' name. All right. I, I started, and, and by the way, we, we actually did a study in the Sermon on the Mount, probably, I think, about five years ago or so. And that was, uh, we did 29 hours of study. I said that we do, line, this is going to be what we're going to get to, a line by line, perhaps a word by word study of the Sermon on the Mount. Because that's what I see is as, as true Christianity. True Christianity, the only way we know what we're supposed to be doing is by following the life and the teaching of Jesus Christ. That, that's what we have. You know, he is the image of God the Father here on earth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is what we are supposed to be imitating, is what Paul, the Apostle Paul said. So we're going to look at that, all right? We're going to look at his life, and we're going to look at his teaching. And specifically, we're going to look at the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, before I do that, I want to say, because I think that the Sermon on the Mount is the single most powerful teaching that the world has ever, ever seen. But don't let me take anything away from what Paul wrote to Timothy when he said all Scripture, all Scripture, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. It's profitable for teaching. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for reproof. 
but above all, it is profitable for training in righteousness. So if our faith is evidenced by our righteous behavior, then we need to be trained in that righteousness. And this is, the Sermon on the Mount is the first teaching that Jesus does as he gathers his new disciples, sets aside the apostles, and then sits at, he is sitting down and training them in righteousness before he sends them out to live this life of faith. Okay? Now, uh, I, I know this has caused a little problem for some people. Because I said what we see around us is not normal Christianity. What we see is what has become common in Christianity. I recognize the fact that the language changes a lot. But a lot of times the reason that the language changes is because the devil is trying to imitate what God did in the Tower of Babel and confuse us by robbing the meaning. He comes to steal. One of the things he's trying to steal is the power of language to communicate with one another. I've used the example before, and I used it at the beginning of this program, probably maybe 25, to 26, 27 weeks ago. And I talked about the instance in the Gospel of Matthew, where and actually it's in all, all Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they all talk of how Jesus encountered a man in the synagogue, right, with a withered hand. And... He said, Jesus spoke to this man and said, stretch out your hand. And it says he stretched it out and it was restored to normal. That's in Matthew 12, 13. Well, you see, at the time, the fact that somebody had a withered hand, the fact that there were beggars, the fact that there were sick, halt, and lame, that was so commonplace. But it wasn't normal. And even today, there are so many things in our Christianity, the way we practice it, is that are withered, they're deformed, out of shape, and dysfunctional. There is so much wrong that it's become all too common. Yet still, the Word of God, the Word who is made flesh and dwelt among us, can speak to us and restore what is supposed to be normal in our walk with Him. Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail again, because as I said, we did this earlier on. But the word normal comes from the Latin word for a carpenter square. In other words, a carpenter square, it's not some days it's 80 degrees and some days it's 95 degrees. It is always that, that 90 degree angle at its base, right? It is, it is an objective truth. We can't have, a, God is not calling us to have opinions about how we're supposed to live. He has given us instruction and that is the word of God. And the word of God is unchanging. The Word of God who is made flesh. The Word says of Him, He is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. The Word of God is unchanging. Okay, so the Sermon on the Mount is a transition from, from being religious to being righteous. Remember, because He's speaking this to Jewish people, the people of God. It's a transition from ritual and relics to relationship. That's normal Christianity. Now, one of the things we need to do right from the very beginning is talk about relevance. Okay? Um, rel the word relevant, just by the way, comes from a Latin word that means, that originally, the root of it means uh, to lift up. Now, what it means in our usage is something that's relevant bears on or it's connected with a matter in hand. It pertains to what we're doing, right? Alice and I were in France, one of, our, one of our trips to France to minister, quite a number of years ago, I think. And I came back, we came back, Alice went with me and came back with me, hallelujah. And I said, I shared this with everybody, what I saw in France at that time was not people who hated Christianity, not a persecution of Christianity, but they just ignored Christianity because it had become totally irrelevant. It had no meaning in people's daily lives. Around the same time, a Christian research organization released their annual survey on the state of the church in the United States. And here are some of the findings from that study. 
They said almost half of all Americans said it didn't matter what religious faith you followed because they all follow the same teachings. They all teach the same lessons. Well, that is surely not true. Half of Americans believe that all people eventually get saved, regardless of what kind of life they live, no matter, and no matter what God they serve, right? Many of the young people who were surveyed said the church is boring. And I, well, I've heard that a lot of times, right? The Bible's not taught often enough, and that faith is not relevant to my career or my interests. That's what's important. Now, a consistent theme from the research was that Americans growing acceptance of limitations. They don't have hope anymore. They don't, they don't have great expectations. Wasn't that a book of Charles Dickens, right? Great Expectations. Because of what's going on in the world. Only one-sixth of American Christians said that they were totally committed to engaging in personal spiritual development. It's not important to them. Among those who believe in the surveys, who said that they were believers, just one-fifth, 20%, said that they live in a way that makes them completely dependent on God. You want to know something? If you're not completely dependent on God, you're not dependent on God. And that's the truth. And you'll, you know, if you're not, you'll find out the hard way. Now, interestingly, another place we spend a lot of time ministering is in the United Kingdom, in England, all over the United Kingdom. And as a matter of fact, we'll be going back this, this coming spring. And a study was just conducted. It was put together by the Church of England, the Evangelical Alliance, and an organization called HOPE. All right. The results show. Now, remember that England is officially a Christian nation. The Queen of England is nominally the head of the church. Okay. The, the Queen is the defender of the faith. It's one of her official titles. But here's a study they just did. And this is, I mean, just, just very recently. They showed that only 9% of the people in that officially Christian country are actually practicing Christians. Less than 10% actually are practicing Christians. Only 21% in that country think that Jesus is God. And fully one in four younger people from 18 to 34 think that uh, Jesus is a mythical or fictional character. Where has Christianity gone, all right? It was certainly that reality that was exposed, well, I mean, I'm going back in time, that was exposed in the survey. It was that attitude, it was that reality that caused the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Justin Welby, now, now he is the head, I mean, he's the official, the top minister, right, in the Church of England, in the Anglican Church, and he's a symbolic head of the Anglican Church worldwide. He said the Christian faith was more vulnerable to comfortable, comfortable indifference rather than opposition. You understand that? He was saying that the greatest danger to Christianity is comfortable indifference, not persecution. Right? That's, that's a recent statement by the head of the Church of England, or, you know, by the, the highest ranking cleric in the Church of England. Indifference. Irrelevance. Where does that come from? Well, one of the major concerns that I have, and I've spoke to so many times, is the educational system here in the United States and in England as well, in the UK as well, where Christian parents, all the parents, basically, send their kids off to government-run schools, all right? They're not public schools, they're government schools. And those government schools, they don't allow Jesus through the doors, okay? Uh, here in, in America, uh, this is a, a horrific statement to have to make, but the simple fact of the matter is, you can use the name of Jesus Christ in the government school system here in the United States without any restriction as long as you're cursing. 
But if you use that name, that only name given by which men can be saved, that name above all names, if you use it as it deserves, as it's supposed to be doing, not using it in vain, not, not abusing it, then you're, then you're wrong and you're not allowed to do that. So your children go to school day after day, week after week, month after month, and they can learn mathematics, they can learn language skills, they can learn all of the things that they're being told, these are the things that you need to be successful in life. But they are being highly educated to the fact that you don't need Jesus because he has no place in all of these things that they're telling you equip you for life. So the schools, the government schools, are literally training up children. Earlier and earlier every year, year after year after year, they're training children to understand that Jesus Christ is irrelevant to their life. What can you do about it? Well, here in the United States, there's things you can do. You can take your children out, put them in a Christian school, you can homeschool. That may be inconvenient. That may be uncomfortable. But you'll stand before God and answer if you don't. Hey. Okay. Years ago, I don't know if you remember B.J. Thomas, the, the Christian singer. I see a quizzical look on Mark and Alice's there shaking her head. Yeah. I mean, he, B.J. Thomas recorded a lot of songs. I, I'm going back to the 80s. Right? Yeah. And he sang a song that was written by Archie Jordan called What a Difference You've Made in My Life. Really a, a lovely, lovely song. Receiving the gift of new life from the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. That should, that, that, that atoning work that brings new life absolutely should give us a new lifestyle. It should cause us to be able to say, like the Apostle Paul did, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. But being irrelevant, or being relevant actually, does not mean that we have to look or act like the world. This is one of the, one of the things that I see going on in the church all over the place. That, you know, to, to try and make ourselves relevant to what's going on in the world, we begin to act like the world. You don't have to have tattoos or piercings. You don't have to use vulgar language to reach the world for Christ. The marks that he bore, his pierced hands and the life-giving words of eternal life that flowed from him are always reaching out to the world, teaching us the way to be relevant, bringing the love of God and the light of his word into every place to raise and lift up. Relevant. That's what it means, right? You know, years ago, um, when Alice and I and Mark were in Belize together, we were, lived there as missionaries. And when we came back to the United States, um, Alice and I and another couple from the church that I had pastored, the last church I pastored in, in the States before we went there, we started a ministry called the M.D. Solomon Institute out in California. We were, we were based out there. And that was based on a vision that the Lord gave me to equip and encourage Christians to live a holy, that's with a W-H, a, a whole, and a holy, H-O-L-Y, a holy and holy integrated life. A life in which a person's business life was not separated from his or her spiritual life. A, that family life is not separated from workplace life. Church life from daily life. Our goal was to teach the best practices in all walks of life as defined by scripture to achieve excellence in all walks of life. Now that was born out of my experience way back in the, in the 70s as uh, a national sales manager. While I was a pastor, I was a national sales manager for a communications company in New York. And I basically, I taught all of the salespeople in that company. I taught, I, we ran that company, the sales force out of that company, out of the book of Proverbs and had an incredible, incredible experience, how God blessed, God, not, he blessed me, both in the spirit 
and in the natural realm, along with everybody around me, which is exactly his promise in Deuteronomy 28. That if you hear his voice and you obey him, he's going to bless you. He's going to bless you coming and going out. He's going to bless you in the city. He's going to bless you in the country. He's going to bless your hand, everything you put your hand to. But he's going to bless your, your, your wife. He's going to bless your children. He'll bless your kitty cats, your puppy dogs. He will bless everything in your life when you are obedient to him and live according to the word of God. Where is that today? The word of God, his divine power, is not about church. It's about everything pertaining to life and godliness. That's what the apostle Peter said. That's 2 Peter 1, 3, right? Everything pertaining to life and godliness, to life and godliness. So that sounds very much like the Lord lifting us up out of the pit, out of the miry clay of this world. It sounds pretty relevant to me. The problem has been over the centuries since the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Jesus or taught by Jesus Christ, that the church has compromised with the world in a way he never intended. And it has increased that compromise, and that's what has made us irrelevant. The people in the world can't tell the difference between us and them. They don't see the reality of the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. That, that, I was going to say that has to change. I promise you that will change. Because he is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. He is coming back for a righteous people who are living by faith. And he will do the work. The work that he began in us, he will complete in us. We may have to go kicking and screaming, some of us, but he's going to do that. Hallelujah. So the purpose of this study is to make us like Jesus while we're in, but not of, this world. I mean, just rapidly, just think of this. I said we're going to look at the life and the teaching of Jesus Christ. Because, you see, if you can separate God's word from the way you're living... You're missing the whole point of this. So everything that Jesus spoke, he lived. And that's got to be our goal in life. That not only do we hear the word, but we do the word. All right? At birth, Jesus was miraculously born in Bethlehem of a virgin, right? In the fullness of time. That's what it says in Galatians 4.4. 4. And in the Gospel of Matthew, it goes on to great lengths to ensure that we know that his coming was according to the scriptures. But as prophesied, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Remember, remember they were, Mary and Joseph were living in Nazareth. But the prophesy, prophecy was that he'd be born in Bethlehem. So God blessed them. And he had to touch the entire nation, if not the empire, of Israel when Caesar commanded that all the people go back to their homes, their original home places, to register for the taxes. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Onerous taxes, taxes they had, but God had a plan. As a child, in the, in the Gospel of Luke, it talks about the fact that at 12 years old, Jesus was in the with the teachers in the temple, right? Remember that? And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers, Luke 2, 47. So from the beginning, Jesus was living this, right? One of the single biggest problems of our day is a disorientation and poor, if not downright evil, behavior of so much of the young people today. Can anybody disagree with that? You say, oh, well, I could. You know, I'm not... I am speaking in generalities, but it is certainly true that we have a problem. Young people have a problem. And it's acting out into evil behavior. At the age of 12, Jesus had chosen to be in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Right? Joseph and Mary had been obedient to the word. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. Now, that's the very opposite of what Dr. Spock taught way back in, I think, in the late 40s when he first wrote uh, Baby and Child Care, one of the biggest best-selling books of all time that affected parents all over. 
that was a parenting guy, all right? And, and he, in that book, and every edition of that book, had such an incredible influence on America. But he was teaching and the parents to turn away from discipline and encourage them to let children have their own way. Think about this verse. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 29, 15. This is what happens when you don't pay attention to the Word of God. You know, there's an, there's an advertisement. I was going to say advert. Here I go be in English again. I, I heard an advertisement on radio not long ago, and I, I don't really remember the context, but I remember because it caught my attention when they said, isn't it too bad that children don't come, talking about newborn children, isn't it too bad they don't come with an instruction book? Well, they surely do. Of course they do. It's called the Bible, the Word of God. The problem is that the instruction book is being ignored because people think they're being told, they're being taught, they're believing that it's irrelevant and doesn't have any place in everyday real life. One of the experts on parenting that I was read up about, uh, he was having a discussion, and he started. He ended with this statement: "One of the things we can be certain of, there has never been a child who was brought up right." Well, one thing I actually know, I can actually be certain of, is those who reject the word of God will never know the truth, because that is a lie from the pits of hell. Jesus was that child who was who was brought up right, righteous. Jesus became a public person. So he went from that, that infancy to being a young child to being a public person. And that public person of Jesus Christ, I want you to know it started with an endorsement. An endorsement that came from man and an endorsement that came from God. John the Baptist said, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Matthew 3.11 Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. And after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, and that's verses 13, and then 16 to 17. This goes to the issue of ordination in the church, by the way. You see, the church doesn't have the power to give ministry to somebody. But we have the obligation to recognize God's call to ministry in other people. And once we recognize God's call in somebody's life, we are supposed to be there to encourage and nurture that. Okay, God has to do the ordaining. All right, we're going to go from there to John, from, from Jesus in the wilderness. And then we're going to go, because we're actually following the Gospel of Matthew, to get to Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And we are going to spend time in those, going through the verses. And I, I promise you, if you love the Lord, you're going to find this an exciting, exciting teaching. Because the Word of God is exciting. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you have given us these words of eternal life. Lord, that you came, you became the word who has made flesh and dwelt among us. And, Lord, that you lived everything. The, every word that you spoke, you heard from the Father, and you went and lived, that we might have that example in you. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, Father. Be back next week for the beginning of this. Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners.